Hey, welcome everybody. It's Jeff here, Home Renovation DIY, and today we have a special guest. We are live from our studio here at our double wide trailer project here in Florida. And speaking of Florida, today we have got a special guest. We got Alan from the Lawn Care Nut YouTube channel, but not just a YouTube channel. Alan has actually got a whole career in the lawn business. Lawn right? care nut. This guy knows grass like nobody else. So if you want to grow your great grass, you're going to want to watch this video today. All right, here we go. Um, Alan, welcome to the show, buddy. Let's just Thanks, make Jeff. sure that our sound and everything's working great. Everybody's happy. Check, check, yeah. check. Great to be here. Fantastic. Alan and I were talking for a few minutes here before we got started, guys. And um, the truth of it is, I know nothing about grass. Okay. I teach DIY homeowner stuff, and I've always been teaching and preaching for years. The outside gets you your greatest return on investment. Curb appeal is everything. All right. I am a slacker when it comes to my lawn and I'll admit it, but you don't have to be. We invited Alan here to join us today because we reached out to somebody who knows what the heck they're talking about so that we can help our community. All right. If you're not familiar with this channel, then we're going to give you information so you can subscribe, follow up. He also has an app on the app store. Okay. So you can download that and get into a maintenance program that'll bring your life to your lawn, sorry, to like it's premium condition. All right. This is why we're here today. I'm sure you all have a thousand questions. This is going to be fun. Alan, thanks for joining us, buddy. Uh, welcome to my channel. We have yet to meet in person. Yeah, this is I know. Very so strange. Close to <laughs> You're just down drive. the street and around the corner, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, we don't really have a lot of rules for tonight. The chat is open for everybody. If you got a question, just fire it off. If you're a member, we're going to do our best to try to make sure that we answer your questions, okay? And if you're not, we'll see what we can do. Um, this should be a busy show. I see that Sean Durkin is in the house. He's a member, and he's got some questions, so we're going to get to that in just a minute. But first, let's just get to the nitty-gritty. Who is the Lawn Care Nut? Alan, tell us a little bit about your backstory. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. I, I, hope we, I know we're going to get some great questions, and I can talk about any grass type all around the country. So... Uh, we'll see what comes out there. But yeah, so I go by the Lawn Care Nut online. Uh, I actually started my career in lawn care at True Green Kim Lawn way back in the late 90s in the Chicagoland area, Overbiter. That's kind of how I usually say it. And uh, started in sales and started working on lawns and ended up deciding that I didn't really like corporate lawn care. I didn't really like working for big corporations. So over time, I was still there. I spent 15 years there. But during that time, the internet started becoming bigger and things started happening. What happened was with True Green Kim Lawn, we were like a price leader. We would sell, we did fertilizer and weed control, in case nobody knows. And uh, we would spray the lawn and get it green with fertilizer and kill the weeds and that type of thing. Well, what happened was we were the cheapest price online, or well, it wasn't online then. We were the cheapest price anywhere. And so because we were cheap, people didn't really believe us for expertise or for our professionalism. They believed us because we were cheap. And so when mm. their lawn started to look bad during the year, and they would call in and go, why is my lawn brown? And we would try to give them an answer. They didn't believe us because we didn't sell ourselves on the quality. We didn't sell ourselves on the expertise. We sold ourselves on the price. So what I did to combat that was I created a blog. And this was in 2007. And I started answering questions. So as I would get questions from customers during the day, I would go home at night and I would write the question as the title. And I would write the answer as the blog post. And within just a few months, this is getting like 15, 20,000 visits a month. And I'm like, well, I don't, why is this? This is pretty cool. Maybe I better learn the internet. So while working for True Green during the day at night, I'm um, banging out things on the internet, teaching myself digital marketing, search engine optimization, all these things, um, paying for courses. You know, there's all these courses, make money from your laptop on the beach. I bought like every one of those. <laughs> right, right. And uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll bring this shorter here in a second. But so while I was doing that, so I was basically, I knew lawn care and now I was learning how do people talk? What do they respond to? What, what answers their questions properly? And in time, uh, I took that to YouTube. And over the years uh, of YouTube, because I knew video would be better for this medium. So I think my first YouTube video was 2009 or so. And um, nobody cared then. Nobody gave any, nobody even watched lawn care videos. There was, there was just nothing. But I, I knew that someday somebody would be there. And um, so quit True Green and started working for a digital marketing agency in Naperville, Illinois. We did yeah. digital marketing for, uh, for auto dealers. And so all during that time, that was another career I did, did that from 2013 until 2018. That's when I was still building my YouTube as a side hustle. But about 2018 is when people started to care. 
and brands started to understand and the power of the internet, but mainly the audience just came and I was the first and only one that actually did any content on lawn care. So I got all the audience and then that just kind of worked into different ways to monetize. You know, I started selling eBooks first, first of all, uh, eBooks and courses. Now those eBooks are now my app. So now you can download my app for free and it'll tell you what to put on your lawn and when all during the year based on soil temperature, based on where you live, your grass type. That started as an ebook. Now it's an app. And then we have a full line of fertilizer that inside the app will tell you what to put down and you can just buy it through the app. It's our yard mastery fertilizer. So there's kind of my whole career progression. That's, quick that's the progression. That's yeah. awesome. Let me ask you a quick question because um, in our business model, we are taking a look at white labeling and bringing products to market and uh, eliminating some of the people along the way to make things more affordable for our people. Mm. Your fertilizer are you in a position where you can bring a better quality to the marketplace or, or like, like what's going on behind the math? Because it's like, we all know when we go to home Depot and we want to buy a, like a bathroom vanity, right? We're getting something that looks sexy from the outside, but it's made with particle board and questionable parts and questionable installation processes. And it just never looks as good in person as it does in the picture. So what's it like in the fertilizer business? Are, are you bringing a better product to the market for competitive price? Is that, is, that a, is that a feasible thing? Like, like where do you market yourself? Are you, are you pricing it out so that you're affordable? Or are you, are you giving the best product and it's expensive? Or can you give the best product and still be competitive? Yeah, I love, I'd like to, the entrepreneur stuff is fun. I'm glad we're getting into that a little bit. So um, essentially what is in the store is kind of general stuff. Yeah, like Scott's brand and things like that. And they okay. do use, they tend to use cheaper materials in the bag. So the way I look at it is this. Uh, several years ago, when you went to uh, a Chili's or an Applebee's restaurant to eat and you wanted to order a beer, you had a choice of Miller Lite and Bud. That was about it. And uh, then over time, all of a sudden, you start seeing a tap handle show up that says Sam Adams, Boston Lager. Yep. Yep. And, and, it, and it comes in slow and it tastes different and it's a stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, everything is different about it. This is the beginning of the craft beer movement. And so then craft beer just blows up. And what do you know about craft beer? Well, it's higher alcohol. It's going to be better ingredients got a lot more choice in styles you're going to get more hops you're going to get more malts a lot more than you get in your watered down miller lights right and so right. there was this whole group of people that love craft beer the other thing was i could get miller light at three dollars a six pack whereas a six pack of craft beer was 10.99 so yes. that's so what we are is we are the craft beer of fertilizer now is what's in my fertilizer better yes i have chelated iron water soluble iron i have i have um micronutrients that are also water soluble. I also use a little bit different form of nitrogen. So yes, I do have better ingredients in my fertilizers. Um, I've also formulated them differently, just like beer. You can put some people are hop heads and some people like multi beers. You know, I got some IPAs in my fertilizer and then I got some stouts in my fertilizer. I got a little <laughs> bit of everything, it. right? But I none of that's that. in everything in the store is Miller Lite. So see, that's I come position. from uh... I have a background. My father was in agriculture. He was in, in premix and feed and, and he was in nutrition. And so what he understood about the, the, the ingredients to make up the formula, it took the, the general marketplace when it comes to like dealing with multivitamins, like 50 years, people were selling multi, multivitamins that were made out of stone and you couldn't ingest it. It couldn't utilize the nutrients, but they could put it on the label because it was in the bottle. And so this kind of a thing, the, the corporate world has really maximized profits with crap material for a long time. And now you've got the craft beer market going, hey, um, have you forgotten that beer should taste good? And so you're doing the same thing, and I get it. And I'm looking to do the same thing with building materials because, honestly, yeah, it's the same thing. And if you don't have smaller independent producers making product, you aren't finding the quality that's on the marketplace. Like when you have someone who's passionate about something, who's building a product and putting their name on it, that means a hell of a lot more than someone who's running a corporation who's just trying to keep their stockholders and shareholders happy. Anyway. Um, I, I have something to add to that because you got yeah. me going here. So this is good. So this is the other thing, right? <laughs> this is content to commerce. This is the Mr. Beast type deal where he put he made Mr. Beast burgers and he put candy bars in Walmart. That's, that's content to commerce. And here's the difference. So you can... You go to Lowe's. If you're, say, you're a 32 year old brand new homeowner 
and you didn't necessarily listen to your dad growing up, so you don't understand how he did the lawn, which was me too. I'm an 80s kid. I didn't listen to my dad either. I'm Gen X. I was Mr. Rebellious to my boomer dad. What, was there a son in history that didn't listen to their dad? That there did? you go, Sorry. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you, so you get to Lowe's and everything on the shelf is scary. What's going to yep. burn my lawn? What's not yep. going to burn my lawn, right? Okay, so the difference there is with me and you, though, they can come onto our website and there's us making videos. Let me show you, man. It's okay. Here's how you do it. Here's step by step. <clears throat> How yep. you apply it? What results you should expect? Why did I put this much nitrogen in it? And why? Why are you gonna? Why is that gonna help you? It's all of the things that the Home Depot CEO won't do, or the Lowe's CEO, or the Scott CEO won't do. That's the difference. And so people will pay more for that because that's that boutique brand that they know mm. has got better ingredients and better, but it also has better support. And then let's just face it, people like to support small businesses, right? So yep. to, to answer your question, we are a little bit more expensive, but the difference is we deliver directly to your door. You don't have to go to Lowe's and dig through greasy old bags. And everybody, if you go to the store right now, your local Lowe's or Home Depot, I'm sorry, all the bags of fertilizer are greasy and broken open and thrown all over the place because it's been sitting on the shelf for six months where my stuff yep. turns and burns weekly. So yep. there are a lot of, you know, and you there's, a going half all the life. there's a half life to nutrition folks. Yeah. And it's just, well, just moisture ingress is really the yep. biggest challenge. So, so we have anyway, the same thing stuff. going on in my business in the paint aisle, right? People will say, oh, you know, bears and everyone's selling paint in the world. Yeah, that's because it's what's at Home Depot and Home Depot is the number one store. Yeah. It doesn't mean there's any value there. And so then I took a look at the bear paint. There's five different quality lines here now. And mm. what they're doing is they're creating products and marketing features and benefits, but there's no comparison to that product. And so if you're the average shopper, you're within five miles of a Home Depot. That's where you're shopping. You show up one day, I need paint. Let's say you're a guy and you're not a painter, but you got to paint you know, your nursery, your wife is on your tail. Hey, paint the nursery. Here's the color. So you show up at Home Depot and there's five different products, all the same, different prices. What do I do? He's not asking a question. <laughs> Let's face it. Men don't ask for directions and they don't ask questions at a hardware store because we're men, damn it. And we're just going to make the decision. And so they'll go, well, that's really expensive. That's super cheap. I'll pick the one in the middle. Yeah. And Home Depot got you because the one that was cheap is probably the same bloody product in a different bucket. But anyway, let's just move on. We got a bunch of people here that want to ask a question. Awesome. Corporations all run the same. I love what you're doing. I love the idea that you can sell product and you can have some integrity and buy value. This is great. Um, I've got, uh, let me see. I got Ottawa. I got Eric back home in Ottawa. I got Matt back home in Ottawa. I got my wife in the comments. We're a team of four. We're all over the planet but we merged together to make this happen. Okay. So what we do is this guys, if you got a question, throw it in the comment section. All right. And Matt is going to bring it up on the screen here so that I can read it. And then I'm going to ask Alan and we're going to have conversations. We're going to try to solve some problems today. It's all about you today. It's about getting you information to solve your questions. I know Alan, we talked earlier, you were, you live in Florida, but you were in Chicago for a while. So you've got experience dealing with the Northern grass, everything going on there right through the Kentucky grass to the Bahia to the St. Augustine down here in Florida. Yep. Everything in Let's, between. So yeah, and everything in between, you know more about grass than I even know what questions to ask. All right. So let's just jump into this and, and we will see where we go with this. This ought to be interesting. So Doug says, uh, tell us about grass alternatives. The overuse of fertilizer, herbicides and water is proving detrimental to nature, natural ecosystems. Yeah. Well, here we go. So we That's got somebody one. who's concerned about the quality of the ecosystem. Why don't you speak to that for a few minutes? So I think the key there is the overuse, the word overuse. So mm. this is why I'm all about education, right? There's a label on everything you buy, every product. Yep. And it's your job as the applicator, in this case, the DIYer. This is your land. This is your home that you live on, that your dog runs on, your kids play on, that you walk on barefoot. It's your duty as a homeowner, as a landowner, to not overuse those things. Because, see, all plants need nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, macronutrients, and, and a bunch of micros and some others. They need those things. Right. But overuse of those can be bad. Just like I need to take a vitamin. I can, I can take vitamins that are organic. By I can go to the produce section in the store and buy a bunch of organic produce, and I can get all my vitamins by eating organic produce. Or I can take a daily vitamin. That's one little capsule that gives me 100% of everything. That's synthetic versus organic. But I'm not going to overuse it. If I eat too many of those, they're going to upset my stomach and it probably could have an issue, right? It's mm. the same thing with the lawn. So read the, read the, the, the fertilizer bag and 
the use rates and the same thing with the herbicide. So I practice integrated pest management, which means we only apply the hard control in this case, a herbicide, which is a plant killer. So you have pesticides, pesticides, kill pests underneath, underneath that you have herbicides that kill plants. You have fungicides that kill fungus. You have, you know, all these different ides, right? He's mentioning yes. herbicides here, which kill plants. Well, if I don't need to blanket spray the lawn, if there aren't weeds everywhere, integrated pest management would say I'm going to use a liquid and I'm going to spot spray only where the weeds are. So instead of using a weed and feed, which is what you buy at Home Depot that puts the weed and the feed, the weed control, the herbicide all over the lawn everywhere, whether there's weeds there or not, I'm going to take a safer, less approach and I'm going to spot spray weeds only. And then what you're going to find is when you fertilize the lawn properly, it gets thicker and it chokes out the weeds naturally, which means less use of herbicides. So I think we need to approach it that way. It isn't lawns are bad. Lawns are terrible. Nobody likes lawns. They destroy the planet. And it's also not let's throw down everything on our lawn willy nilly and mm. be crazy about it. Let's follow the label and meet somewhere in the middle. So I get it. So there's a responsibility issue here. And yeah. like a lawn that's poorly managed is going to it's going to lose the battle to the weeds. Correct. Especially in Florida. But see, I've, I've recently taken up golf. And the only reason I've done that is because both of my sons are golfing now. And if I want to spend time with them on the weekend, I have to learn how to golf. <laughs> so what I'm learning is, is when I go to golf courses, these places are in immaculate condition. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're implementing some of those strategies, right? They're, they're like really intense on making sure that those lawns are incredibly full, right? There, there's no bare spots. There's no room yeah. for a weed to grow in because it's an opportunity. Yeah. And sports turf is a whole different animal because they don't just care about how it looks. They care about playability and other things. Yeah. But a golf course is a great example of somewhere that's going to use the least amount of pesticides and fertilize as possible. They're going to try to keep everything away. They don't want to lose water. So they'll do the best to have proper drainage just to keep all their water on site, for example. Um, they're not going to overuse fertilizers and because they have budgets. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, so they're homeowners still make are a dollar, like, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. So homeowners are more likely to overuse. And so that's why I work with homeowners and DIYers and work with them mostly. Interesting. Okay. So it's, it's the philosophy of if your lawn is healthy, it's easier to maintain it. Mm -hmm. exactly gotcha. Right. All right. Well, let's get to the next question here. We got uh, Rob. I'm a Canadian that's used to dealing with lawns in Canada. However, which isn't much different than Chicago. Let's just be honest. Mm -hmm. However, we purchased a house in Florida and needed to top dress the lawn and begin seeding. What's the best soil for Florida and seed? Okay, wow, that's a loaded question. It's a great right, question. Take your, take your time with that. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, it's an awesome question. So I'm going to tell you, Rob, to not seed in Florida. So uh, we sod here. You could you mostly sod. I'm just going to tell you. The reason why is in Florida, because our growing season is so long, and I don't know what part of Florida you're in, but if you're south of I-4, your growing season's year-round. But even in Jacksonville, it's it's 10 months. So what happens is because the growing season is so long, the weeds are going to outrun your seed and outcompete your seed. Ah. They are because a lot of the weeds are annual, and they also are bred and born to go fast, to take ground yeah. quickly, drop seeds, and get out, whereas our yeah. grass is going to form slowly. The other thing about warm season grass seed. You can't get St. Augustine grass then. There's no such thing as St. Augustine grass seed. doesn't exist. Um, you could get Bahia or Bahia or Bahia, depending where you live. You can get that, but that takes 30 days to germinate. It's almost impossible to water every day perfectly for 30 days just to get your seed to germinate. And then once it does germinate, it has to grow rhizomes, stolons. It's just, I'm promising you, you will be in a losing battle trying to seed. If you are going to seed and you're dead set on it, then Bermuda grass is your best, most aggressive choice. And I would check with your HOA first because a lot of them won't even allow Bermuda grass into different neighborhoods. So with all of that, I'm going to tell you that, and oh, by the way, you're going to have to use a lot more chemical when you seed because you're going to have to spray a lot more weeds out of it while you protect your grass. Whereas when you sod, you have an immediate blotting out of the sun. It just blocks all the sunlight below the soil surface, which then stops a lot of the weeds from germinating as well as there's immediate competition there. And then it allows the grass to only have to root and grow top because it's all knitted together with rhizomes and stolons already. So you're just going to do a lot better sodding. There's a big labor issue there, but I think you might find that sod in Florida isn't as expensive as maybe what you've seen up North. Isn't that fascinating? Now, as far as soil goes, I say, love the one you're with. Don't hate yeah. our sandy soil. Because people up north, when I was in Indiana and Illinois, they used to hate the clay soil. 
our clay soil is terrible. Then I come down here and people say, oh, our sandy soil in Florida is terrible. Listen, it's, it's, there are beautiful lawns everywhere that you live that are growing in the native soil. So love the soil you have and just, ex and don't try to amend it with a bunch of top dressing. Having a living root, number one in the soil is the best thing to amend soil are living roots because that draws microbes and activity and earthworms and all of those things around that mm. living root. That's what's going to make good soil. And then you can add in amendments over time um, by using organic fertilizers, natural based fertilizers that bring carbon into the soil. There's a lot of ways to amend soil over time while you're also feeding it and growing that lawn in. So then you're basically saying love the one you're with. Yeah. Sod versus seed. Yeah. Okay. So you want to put down 2000 square feet of sod. There's a full Saturday. Yeah. But I mean, it's back breaking work, but, but then you're done. Then you're just watering from there because otherwise you're, you're spending all your time and money fighting weeds for months. Well, in the rainstorms that we get here, you know, they, it, you'll get a couple inches in, in a few minutes and the, and the things are rushing and our sandy soil, it'll just rush and wash all your yeah. seed right down into the, into the and storm. Your seed's gone, and, and what replaced yeah. it was all the weed seed from up the hill. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there that's you go, Rob. Advice. I hope I, I, hope I just like saved that. Rob some headaches. <laughs> yeah. Save you some headaches. Um, that's awesome. Okay. Let's get to the next question here. All right. Isabel wants to know, my dogs have run a huge bear spot in my front yard. Okay, what's the best grass to put in there that will be hardy? I'm in Federal Way, Washington. Is it too late to plant now? Yeah, so this is another challenging one. Um, so you have cool season lawn in Washington. So you have Kentucky bluegrass, tall fescue, or rye. Rye grasses are mostly your choices. Um, the challenge is, is that there are two natural enemies to lawns, dogs and trees. Uh, those are the two natural enemies that lawns have. And the dogs, because not only their urine, but it's a foot traffic in this case. The, the dog just keeps wearing out the same spot, digging in it, whatever. So what's going to happen is you're going to spend all this time replanting and the dogs are just going to rewear the spot. So what I tell, and, and by the way, all of the cool season grasses, none of them do really well to foot traffic. So I can't tell you like, oh, you should go get this particular grass. It'll do better. Just cool season grass in general, they all do about the same underfoot traffic, which isn't very good. So in that case, you got to try to retrain the dog or retrain the humans to push the dogs into other places or to rotate the yard. Um, and if that's not the case, then you just learn to live with the dogs. If they're going to run over that area, then you just kind of have to let it go. I wish I had better alternatives for you. In the South, I do. We do have better, higher traffic grass. But where you have uh, in Washington there, it's just it's going to be a challenge that way. Yeah, yeah. I've learned resod that. it. You when, when you have a dog, you, you, have to, you have to give up a certain amount of expectation in life they're, they're going to do their own thing they're going to do their own damage yep and, and they're worth it and they're worth it not a bad not a, not a bad way to finish that off all right let's get to the next question cheers isabel the lawn engineer now am i stepping into your space is this somebody that you're familiar with yeah that's vince he's a friend of mine nice, nice. okay so do you know of any good tools to identify weeds he struggles with identifying weeds in order to kill with the right herbicide okay you end up spraying blind with a with a triplicate i get it so it's like, okay, I got three solutions and three problems, and I can buy a three-in-one solution, but I don't want to waste time with herbicides. So how do you identify which weed is what? Yeah, so there are apps. I think Picture This is one of the better ones. But okay. I have a, a more foolproof way, and it takes a little bit more time, and, and people are sort of apprehensive to do it, but it works. And that is that, so in the U.S., we have what are called county extension offices. They're extensions of the local land-grant universities, and their job is to help with these types of questions. So if you just search county extension near me, you'll see them all come up. Ours are all based around the University of Florida here. And they will have office hours or times when you can call in as a homeowner and say, hey, here's what I'm dealing with. Can I send you some pictures of it? And now you're going to get an identified a proper identification from your county extension specialist who lives and operates in your area and is educated properly on what they're seeing, and they'll be able to give you the proper idea on the weed. Because so many of them look the same, especially the grassy weeds. They have so many ways that they look alike, and these folks know, well, it's, they know the time of year, what weeds they should be seeing, right? They can do a lot of process of elimination just because they live in your area to get yeah. you the right, right? So I personally, if you have weeds that you're continually struggling with, then I would definitely reach out to the county extension office rather than just try to use an app. I love it. That's very similar to us in the construction industry. Like we have this thing called asbestos, but there's really three different main varieties and they all have different consequences and different approaches and different ways to remediate them. And so, yeah, and, and we can just take in a sample and, and, and they'll come back and tell us what's going on. Yep. That's yeah, amazing. Sure. 
Very cool. I didn't have any idea. All right. Next question. <clears throat> Joe wants to know, he's in the Northeast U.S. property. How to get rid of moles. Now, Joe, have you been to his, the Lawn, Lawn Care Nuts website? Because uh, on his YouTube channel, he did a whole video about how to get rid of a mole. I watched that myself. I thought that was fascinating. We had moles when I was a kid. So I was totally hooked right from the beginning. Um, anyway, give, give him the short version and then we can tell him to go watch the YouTube video. <laughs> yeah. So I actually never had a problem with moles in all the years I've been doing lawn care until this year in Florida. I was like, oh, this is great. And I get some content out of it. So right. <laughs> for me, I, I studied all the same things you guys did. People put chewing gum in the holes. They'll try to hook something up to the exhaust of their car and blast them out. There's poisons, wow. all these things. I, I wanted to go with a route that said I could 100% be sure the mole is gone. And the only way that that would happen is I have to have a body. So I went with a trap. Um, I can't even remember what it's called now, but they're on Amazon. But it's just a spike trap that you set. And when they go underneath it, it, it spikes right down on their head. The mm. key with it, and it gets them. The key with that, though, is you have to put the trap in the right spot. So you have to be observant. And you, you're observant by every day I would go out and stomp down the fresh tracks. And then the next day I would see where the new tracks were. And I had to take a little bit of time and suffer a little bit of damage over time and let him do right. his thing. So I learned his habits and found his main runway. And yep. I, I, I think I got lucky, but I set the trap in one spot and I got him within a couple hours. So there you go. No body, really no it. crime, eh? There you go. That's it. You got it. So <laughs> traps are the best. Love it. All right. Next question. Okay. Here it comes from We Break It, We Fix It. I love it. That's, <laughs> in New England, just cut a bunch of pine trees to expand our front yard. Just curious if you had any advice for stumps and how to go about getting healthy grass over them. Other than stump grinding, like that still leaves a lot of roots, right? Pine trees are notorious for that. So do you have any advice for that? Yeah. And the other thing is wherever you've had a conifer growing, you're going to have spoiled soil underneath. Yeah, that's just part of their defense mechanism, right? To keep competition out. So whenever okay. they drop needles and things like that, it changes the pH of the soil and the composition of the soil. So that's nice. why grass won't grow under a lot of evergreen trees and things because it's changing the soil and it's keeping competition out. So it's that's not a, the, it's not a pH. It's not a sun thing. It's a pH thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. If sun doesn't help. So we yeah. can go, if you guys want to know why not that's evergreens, we can go into like why oak trees and everything else kill grass underneath. It's pretty fascinating, but for pine trees or, or evergreen trees for sure. Uh, so there's that your soil's probably a little bit messed up. And then yes, there is all of those clippings and chippings that are left. So I've never had any luck with anything else other than you have to bring in a backhoe and dig out as much as you can. So you can get at least six inches of topsoil in there. And even if there's any chips left or anything, you're always going to have problems where that spot of the lawn will dry out first. You'll also get mushrooms there. Cause again, any Mushrooms aren't bad, but it's just that's all that organic material, all that wood material breaking down yeah, over yeah. time so things can settle. So it's really best if you have it opened up now, if, you've, if you're going to cut those down, get in there with as much heavy equipment as you can and just rip as much of it all as you can and just redo your lawn. So instead of thinking, I'm just going to patch up the couple areas where the trees were, maybe you have to just rip a lot of it out. And start okay, so and instead of just now. looking at it as we're not just cutting down a tree, we're not just stump grinding, which needs to still happen, then we're excavating. Yep. So we almost want to treat that area like we're going to put in a patio and get six inches down and remove all that soil, replace it with a healthy soil, treat your yard like a burn victim and give it new skin. There you go. Like really like that's the idea here. Eh? Yeah. You keep the, I mean, is if you have existing soil, that's there for sure, but you want to get all those roots out and any chips or anything, it's the roots and are the main thing. Cause they'll just continue to wreak havoc over time. Okay. So you can't just grind the stump. You've got to follow those five or six main Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. And That's with evergreens, it shouldn't be too bad. It should be mostly yeah. deep with an evergreen. It shouldn't be real wide. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. All right. Very cool. Awesome. Let's get to the next question. All right. Renita, has, uh, she's in Phoenix, Arizona. She's got 100 feet already added Bermuda grass one week ago. Nothing is happening. <laughs> it's a new house. Never had grass before. Okay. What's the best way to prepare the yard? So the question is, A, I think it's two parts. Um, is a week enough time to expect a result? especially with the temperature and Renita, we don't have any way to know, but do you have an irrigation system? How much water are you putting on a daily basis? If you have an answer to that question, throw it in the comments real quick and I'll let Alan take it from here. Yeah. So that's a, if, if you're saying you added Bermuda grass a week ago, nothing's happening. So I'm assuming that seed then, because if you had a sod it, you'd see the sod there. Right. Exactly. Um, that's fair enough. Yeah. So if you added seed, it's going to be a challenge because 
when that grass first germinates, it's not hardened off, and those 100-degree temps are going to be tough on it. It's dry where you live, which is nice, because it's usually humidity that burns grass down, just so people know, not necessarily heat. Yeah. Um, but if you seed it, it's going to take a good two to three weeks for Bermuda grass seed to germinate, and then it's going to take another good six to eight weeks over and above that for it to spread out, because it's going to push out rhizomes and stolons to start filling in. Mm. So you're looking at a good three to four-month ramp to get Bermuda grass to cover an area if you seeded it um, if you sodded it and you're saying it's not rooted yet because that can happen right you sod you water and you want to pull it up and look for roots so you should see when you sod when you fresh sod and you're watering every day the first thing you do is you water enough and after you water you go outside and lift the sod up and make sure it's wet underneath if the gra if the water hasn't penetrated through the sod to the soil below you need to water longer and you're going to want to water up to three times a day probably in your heat maybe even four times a day soak it real good now, you should start to see white root hairs going down after just three or four days, and it should be fairly well-rooted where you can't pull it up within 10 days. So that's there you go. pretty general so I'll just, idea. I'll just bring this into you. So she's answering back. They do have irrigation, and yes, it is seed. So it's it's yeah. right now it's still a patience game. Oh, yeah. Long, long slow burn. Just okay. keep watering. That's it. Water, water, just, water. Just keep on watering. Yep. All right. Fantastic. That's great advice. Awesome. Cheers. Well, this is fun. I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating the fact that we're able to help our community with things that I have no idea about. This These are not awesome. easy questions either. These are some. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, uh, I get this question from my team all the time. I said, how do you do live shows and answer questions all day long? It's like, aren't you exhausted? I'm like, no, I love this stuff. Like I love helping people. And this like, this is this, I, I just get a kick out of it. Um, so it's even more fun because I don't even have to work that hard today. <laughs> this is my thing. I could talk about this for hours. So you could, that's, that's why we're here, my friend. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's get to the next question. Let's see what we got here. Mike wants to know any general tips on what to look for in a lawn when buying a house. Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, that's a good question. So there's, there's yeah. the considerations of how much work do you want to do? Just those types of things. Right. Um, because you really can't even buy a lawnmower until you know how big the lawn is. So the first thing I would do when you're looking at a house is measure the lawn. You know, do you have 5,000 square feet? Do you have 10,000, 20 an acre? So that would let you know, am I going to have to buy a riding lawn mower that's five, six, seven thousand, or can I get away with a $300 walk behind mower? So I would look at that kind of thing. Yeah. As far yep. as the way the lawn looks, I would look for sun and shade patterns. So it depends on the time of the year. You guys know that the angle of the sun changes all throughout the year. So the way that the lawn looks this time of year, it may look different another time of year, like after winter, when the sun position has changed and the days were shorter. So right now we're in the middle of the summer. These are the longest days we have. So if you're shopping for the house right now and there are large bare areas in the lawn from shade, those are not going to get any better because we have the longest days right now. Hmm. So that would be something you would realize, all right, is that area where I'm going to try to, it, the grass is not growing there now in the summer at the longest days. So maybe I'm going to have to do some landscaping around those trees to create shade gardens instead of grass. I would look for that type of stuff, sun and shade exposure. And I would look for drainage issues. Um, I'm sure you, you've dealt with this, Jeff. J drainage around a house will, I don't care what you've done right. If, if you have standing water around your house, it just ruins everything. So, you know, and, yeah. that, and French drains and, and surface drains and drainage, it's, it's physically hard work, but it isn't engineering work. It's just a little bit of fall is all you need. Oh, it's definitely so, a DIY project. That's totally, yeah, totally just break your back. Yep. So yeah. I, I would look for that. Do I have standing water in areas uh, areas that are washing out, that kind of thing. Those are the things I would look for. Nice. Thank you. Um, Matt, I was looking at the comments and there was a question there from someone from Canada wanting to know about herbicides. Can we scroll down to that one? Daniel, I think is what his name was. There we go. Ah, Daniel wants to know, what can Canadians uh, use for herbicide? It seems like all we're allowed to use is corn gluten meal and a really weak weed killer spray. That kind of reminds me like a lot of, you know, science fiction B movies where they're trying to kill people with a really bad gun and they're like, like 4,000 feet tall. It's an insurmountable task to kill weeds in Canada. What, what are our options up here? Yeah. So corn gluten meal I've never used, but I know that it's, it's used a lot in natural and organic lawn care. And I think just from what I've heard is it takes a few years of applications for that to actually build up and have an effect. So mm. that's, all I can say about corn glue, that's a pre-emergent stop like crabgrass and things like that. And I don't even know what weeds it'll stop. As far as the, the weed killer spray, which we call post-emergent herbicide, the, the products you're using are probably iron-based. And so what they basically are is it's a high dose of iron. And a too high of a dose of iron will kill a plant. 
A proper dose of iron will turn a plant a dark blue-green color, but too much will kill it. It becomes toxic. And so that's what you're using are high doses of iron. The challenge there is, is that a lot of weeds are not susceptible to high doses of iron. They just eat it and love it. And so that's where you're saying that you have that weak weed killer spray. So in this case, the best thing for you to do is invest in one of the best weed pullers that you can find. And I know that sounds not so great, but there is actually, because of these laws in Canada, there's companies that have built really well made, easy to yeah. use weed pullers. Yeah. I would get out. And if you think about it, if you pull five weeds a day for one month, you've removed 150 weeds. That's a lot of weeds. So I would look That's at it that a lot way. Of weed. <laughs> yeah, take it as a challenge that way. And then yeah. along the way, you do have fertilizer there. Apply a lot of nitrogen. I know a lot is not a technical term, but apply nitrogen fertilizer to thicken the grass up because that's going to be your best defense, right? So when weeds go away, you want to thicken the grass up. And I would also do a lot of overseeding in the fall, same thing, to thicken that grass up so that it can be my most valuable tool in fighting the weeds. And then the last thing I would do is a mow often. The more you mow, the healthier your lawn will grow. And it also help to keep out some weeds. Some weeds can be mowed out in general. Okay, so the, let me ask you this question. Does, does the nitrogen fertilizer fertilize the weeds as well? It does. But the grass, there's more grass plants there, and so they're able to crowd out because they are the greater numbers in most cases. Gotcha. You know, now, if you have a lawn that this is where we go, we have to make a decision. If a lawn, I say if a lawn is 30%, this is cool season grass or warm season. If it's 30% turf, if you look out over and it's got weeds and stuff everywhere and it's at least 30% turf, then you can bring that lawn back. Now, not in Canada, because you're going to need some herbicides for that. <laughs> so in Canada, I might have to say, I got to have at least a 70% weed-free lawn to start with. Otherwise, I'm just going to scrape it all up and start over. Because you might have to do that. If you have so many weeds and you don't have a herbicide to use, then maybe it's time to bring out a sod cutter, scrape everything out, and just resod and start from fresh. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, and you can rent that at the Home Depot, by the way. It's not a bad machine. All right. Yep. <laughs> Let's get on to the next question here. we got a super chat from Lawrence. Cheers, buddy. Appreciate that. Um, a 2000s house in Tennessee. He's got two old tree uh, in his yard showing roots and occasional mushrooms. Yeah, okay. Do I need to dig up all the tree roots before I try and seed and promote any grass growth? Okay, so this gets into growing grass under trees. So let's talk about why it's so tough. And this is with any any tree. So the first thought you'd think is the shade, and that is the tr that's the truth. Trees they blot out the sun, and yep. we all and grass plants need uh, sun to grow. And people will say, oh well, there's shade tolerant grass. There's there's grass that grows good in the shade. That's a subjective thing. There's really not any grass that's going to grow without at least four to five hours of direct sun during most of the year. Keeping in mind that we have shorter days in the in the winter and longer days in the summer. So with that, you have that shade. The second thing you have then is the competition in the soil, what he's talking about with the roots. They're competing for space, literally with the grass. Secondly, they're competing for nutrients and water, and they're bigger, and they're going to take up more of the nutrients in the water. Hmm. And then the, the other thing that happens with trees is when it rains, salts wash off of the leaves, and the salts come down below, and that spoils the soil and kills the grass beneath. So the challenge that you have here, Lawrence, isn't necessarily just the roots. It's all of those factors combined. And what I can tell you is, is if that, you have good, healthy grass in other areas and not there. I would take that as a sign from nature that it's just not a place that you're going to grow grass. Now, if you think you can, if you're going to try, I'm going to tell you there's not a way to remove the roots because you end up killing the trees, right? right? I mean, unless you're removing the trees. So it's not like you can prune roots out so that you can have lawn. It doesn't work that way. You kind of have to make this give and take. And that's why I tell people, don't be afraid to put mulch rings around trees and grow hostas or shade loving plants under there or flowers, things like that. Make some nice curb edging and then have your grass flow out in the areas where it's going to get enough sun and it's not going to get that wash off. But tree roots is another, that's why I say these are hard questions. It's just one of those that I just don't have an answer for because there isn't one, you know? Right. So if you're looking for an aesthetic solution, don't try to grow your grass right up to the tree. Build out a, a tree garden area mm -hmm. because there are easier solutions to fix that. And then you can have a definitive line where your grass stops and then your, your garden starts. Exactly right. Loving it. All right. Let's get on to the next question. This is so educational. My, I'm learning so much. I'm feeling guilty for having such a lousy lawn all of a sudden. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Avishai, any thought about those products like grow tracks that come as a roll of seeds plus compost plus fertilizer? Ooh, interesting. Yeah. So I think those are gimmicks. So uh, 
what grow tracks is, is it's this green paper and they embed grass seed in it and then you're supposed to roll it out and just water it. Yeah. It's just an expensive thing. I, I, I'm talking about now northern lawns, cool season lawns, Kentucky bluegrass, turf type tall fescue, perennial rye. You don't need any special thing added to your seed. Plain naked grass seed. If you give it enough water, it will grow. It's that easy. You don't need grow tracks. If if you've had problems with growing seed in the past, it's because you didn't water enough 99% of the time. I promise you that. Um, so that's really the issue. The other thing is, if you want to test that, go buy any grass seed at the store and put uh, uh, about a half a handful or not even that, just a little bit in a coffee cup and put water on it and set it in your window. And you'll have grass growing in that coffee mug within a, a few days because it, it's water is the factor. There's no soil there. There's nothing growing in a coffee mug. Now, it won't live in there for long, but it'll grow. That just shows yeah. you, illustrates how easy it is to grow grass seed. You don't need these gimmicks to do it. Now, there is one thing you can do. If watering will be a challenge for you, there's a lot of sunlight that will dry it out or or um, you're afraid that you might get rushing rainstorms that will wash things away, then there are coverings that you can use for your grass seed. So get your naked grass seed, put it on the dirt that you've prepared properly, and then you can get some coverings. Peat moss is one. You can also get recycled newspaper pellets and things like this that you can spread around, but you keep those very thin and it's very cheap. You don't need this whole all-in-one thing because if you think about grow tracks, Anyway, I mean, how many of those would you have to buy to, to get a thousand square feet? Like a couple hundred of those? I mean, just do the math on the price. It's just really expensive. So just trust me, naked grass seed grows super well with just water. There you go. It all comes down to just being patient. Yeah. Really? Okay, cool. Let's get the next question. Oh, and we have another super chat. Uh, in Texas, with an underground sprinkler leak that doesn't create swampy spots, yeah, lawn is starting to crack. Any tips to find evasive sprinkler leaks? Ouch. That's yeah, that's going to be out of my depth on that one. Sorry, <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I I mean I can do dirty work on irrigation. I can replace valves and heads and add things, but I don't know how to like track down leaks. That is definitely not not my thing. I mean, I would just start digging. I would guess where you think it is, and I think it's just digging a bunch of holes <laughs> until you find the leak. You know, at the end of the day, um, the best way to find out where your leak is, is start closest to the water supply and work your way out. <laughs> there you go. And hope you're lucky on the right end of the line. <laughs> hope you find it soon. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's it. I oh, love it. All right. Oh, okay. Next question for Jesse wants to know for lawn leveling. And there's a question we haven't talked tackled yet today. It's about uh, creating a nice flat lawn. Mm -hmm. Like when I was growing up, we had the big lawn roller, right? We'd put the garden hose in it. We'd put all kinds of weight. All three of us kids would sit there and drag that thing around the yard for about four or five hours. And my dad would just kind of like sit there and smile. Um, <laughs> when, when do you recommend I, he begin starting, first of all? And I know it'll be a multi-year process, but don't know when I should start. Also, my plan is to use sand, soil, and manure mix. Is that good? Jesse, again, I don't, I don't, guys, when you're asking questions, we need to know your geography. I'm going to guarantee you there's a different answer for this for clay versus sand versus rock. So hit me up, Jesse. Bring me up to speed, man. If you're here and you, you, you can give us some more information, that'd be great. This Go is ahead. a really good question. This give it a fun. shot. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'll give it different for, because everybody's listening. A lot of people listening want to level their lawn. So we'll talk about it for warm and cool season. So I'll just assume that he's in a warm season area just to start. So that's going to be St. Augustine grass, Bermuda grass, Zoysia grass, or Bahia. Those are the main ones. Okay. Um, if you're there, the best time to do it is right now. So right now for warm season turf is the peak growth period. This is when it's growing the fastest. It's spreading the most rhizomes, the most stolons. Because when you level it, you're going to be bringing the level up. So the grass is going to have to seek the new level. So you want to do it when it's in its in its major growth phase, which for those grass types is right now. For cool right, season lawns, Real quick, Alan, I'm yeah. going to jump in. Jesse got back to us. He's in okay. zone 5B. Oh, man, you're going to ask me to look at that map, bro. Can you just give me a state? Like, seriously, Jesse, could you just tell us what town you're in? It's up north. Uh, 5B is up north. Yeah, it's up north. Yeah, so he's it's got up cool north. Yeah. yeah. He's got cool season lawn. Okay, so cool season lawns, you don't want to do it now because they grow most in the spring and the fall. And so you want to take advantage of that. And this is just nature, right? Okay. You know that your cool season lawn grows a lot in the spring. You're mowing every week. In the fall, it'll do it again. In the summer, what does it do? It chills. Might even try to go dormant. Like a lot yep. of lawns in Illinois and across the Midwest right now are dormant because they had a drought yep. and heat. Yep. So now is not the time. So that's the first thing. So you're going to want to do it in the fall. Excellent time to do it. Yeah, right he's in the Northeast. Mowing. We got back yep. from him. That's good. There okay. you go. Good to go. Yep. Now let's talk about sand soil manure. Sand is your very best leveling agent. If you go to the beach, 
and you look at where the water is flowing up, you're going to see it's flat. Now, it's not level. We, we're not talking about level because lawns need to have some slopes for water uh, yep. flow, but they want to be flat. You want them flat. So when you talk about a, if you go to the beach, you'll see it's flat. Sand is flat when water hits it. So sand is the mm -hmm. best leveling agent. Nice. Soil and manure will be shed from the sand. No matter how much mixing you do, they're not going to stay. They're going to shed. So we need to think about what is the use of those. So soil and manure are organic materials. And what happens to organic materials over time? They break down. So if I'm trying to level a low spot with something that's going to break down over time, I'm not really leveling my low spot, am I? You're increasing gonna, your work over time, yeah. Yeah, it's going to break down. That's good for the soil, though. Those things are excellent for the existing soil as amendments. They're not necessarily good for leveling or flattening a lawn. Okay, so that's the thing to think about. The other thing is, where's the soil from? Does it have weed seeds in it? Did they pull it out of some farm field? Are you bringing in right. like, things that you don't want to deal with later? And then manure, manure can be hot. It can have a high nutrient content that you don't have any way to control because it's just manure. So I would be careful with that too. You might be over fertilizing areas or, or, or if it's one area and you put all this manure in and it's got all this nutrient rich, well, then this area over here that didn't get that's going to be lighter, <laughs> lighter green than this area where the nutrient rich manure is. And the same can happen with soil. So what I recommend is you do all of your leveling with sand, 100%, the finest sand you can get. The same sand that you use for your pavers, paver sand, can be used to level a lawn. Yes. And spread it nice and easy. Dry sand spreads easier than wet sand. Just makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But either way, use the sand. Let that grass seek its new level. And then amend the areas, because you are going to want to amend the areas, because sand does have no, no nutritional value. But amend those areas through your fertilizing. So have when you're fertilizing your lawn, use some organics, some naturals, things like that. They're going to amend the soil over time. I like to use biostimulants like humic acid, fulvic acid. These are adding carbon to the soil and that will help that area to amend itself over time because your sand cap is only going to be two inches at the most because like he knows it's a, it's a multi-year process. So it's going to be one inch two, or two inches this year, maybe one or two next year. So that mm. sand cap over time, it's going to get amended as you're using these biostimulants and, and things like that. It'll be fine. But that's what I recommend overall sand is your best leveling agent. So is it fair to say that when it comes to lawn care and maintenance, and, and we, we have a world we like instant gratification, right? Like what's my fix today? You have two options, remove your yard, grade it, and then put in new sod, or take a multi-year approach of DIYing it and save your money. And, and but it's gonna, you gotta, it's gonna be a multi-year approach. That's right, it's a, it's a long-term, it's a marathon. This is why when I tell people, you buy your house, right? When you bought your house, everything was dead. The countertops are dead. The roof is dead. The walls yes. are dead. But there is a living asset outside, and it changes all the time. And if you let it go, it will show you that it's changing in a negative way. So it's that's why a lot of people don't necessarily, that are DIYers, don't do lawns, because it's just so different. It's Because nature always wins. You're never going to beat nature, and you have to realize that. Now, I Yeah, I can't just tackle it, it in no. a weekend and be done, right? And I have done, to, like, right. I have, it's a relationship. You have, that's exactly right. And you have to learn yeah. your land, right? You, I know areas of my land every year that this time of year, they're going to get diseased just because it happens. Well, now that I know that I don't get upset about it, I can do remedies ahead of time, or I can just learn to live with it. This is the other thing. It's okay to live with a lawn that has problems. My lawn on YouTube has problems. Now they don't show all the time, but there are, they're there. I see them. This is the other thing, right? I see my own flaws that people don't see. So I see all the flaws in my lawn, but people walking by just see this great lawn. You know, but because I'm in a relationship with it, I see the flaws. See, now we can get into relationship advice. Maybe you shouldn't see the flaws, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I was yeah. looking for an analogy with being married, but I'm just going to leave that alone. <laughs> They're there. Yeah, that's that goes back to love the one you're with. Don't worry about the neighbor's lawn. You worry about there yours. There you go. You don't need to win that award for the best lawn in the neighborhood. All right. Um, let's get to another question before I get in trouble. All right. Joe wants to know his neighbor has a deciduous tree that shades a portion of the yard where my cool season grass is nice and green through the summer. If he removes this tree, I'm worried about the loss of shade thoughts. Well, can I just chime in? It's his tree. <laughs> now, what can we do if he removes the tree to um, make adjustments to keep that lawn healthy there? Yeah. So what Joe's probably noticed is so there are uh, grasses that do better in shade, like fine fescues and things like that. So probably mm. what's happened, this area is shaded and he's got grass there, so it's getting enough. So the grasses that are there have adapted to that environment or that microclimate. And he's right. If he removes the tree, 
it's going to be tough for that grass to adapt. So what I would plan on Joe is I would just hope for the best and see how it does, but I would just plan on uh, seeding in some fresh cultivars in the fall in that area, something that is a little bit better with suns and, and is going to work better with that new area. And I would just plan on doing that. Just seed in some new, better grass over time. Seed in some grass that's going to be better suited for that environment so that you can win the battle against the weeds over time. Yeah. And it's what's, it's the strong survive, right? So right yeah. now what he's got is the gotcha. strong survived in the shade. Well, yeah. now they're going to change that environment. Those people may not be the strong to survive in the sun, but you should still hope for that and see what does gotcha. survive and just be prepared to seed in some fresh stuff. Yeah. Sometimes you need the air force. Sometimes you need the Marines. I mean, that's just go. how it works, right? Hoorah. Right. All right. Let's get on to the next one. Uh, launch pad McQuack. You know, I love doing live shows just to see people's handles. Anyway, any thoughts <laughs> on what no mo may might be doing to my lawn? Yeah. So no mo may for those of you that uh, are not aware is a movement, I guess, or a, something where people don't mow their lawns all through May. And the idea is you're letting the uh, weeds grow, which a lot of the weeds have flowers like clover and dandelions and things like that. And that's for the pollinators. That's for the bees and things like that. That's the idea. I, I think oh, that's. A, I had no idea this was a. Okay, cool. So there's a there's a and I don't think Launchpad McQuack is talking about it in this way, but there is a strong movement to totally outlaw lawns. Like there are people that literally are lawn haters. Um, I see them on Facebook. It's they're interesting people. So um, there are people that believe the earth is flat too. So I'm not, yeah, not too concerned. I, I'm all about balance. Let's meet in the middle. Yeah. So they so please. some of those people have no mo may, which I think is a good compromise, right? Right. But here's the thing. No mow may doesn't work because may in cool season lawns and in warm season, it's when they're growing extremely fast. We have longer days then in the north. We still have mild temps and rain. And in the south, we have enough long days that our, our grass is growing. Mm. So no mow may means you're letting your grass grow way overgrown. So we have what's called so maybe the one... no mow June would be better. Actually, just what would be better is <laughs> if you care about pollinators to plant flowers on your porch or like oh, okay. around your flower beds for the pollinators yeah, yeah, yeah. and let the lawn be the lawn. Um, yeah. that's kind of how I do it. Um, so but can I just jump in here? Cause yeah. you know, Alan, um, we had three quarters of an acre with the farmhouse and I was not a lawn guy, but we definitely threw clover everywhere just mm -hmm. to help fill in the gaps. So right? it, it's it, excellent lawn. It, it is, it is considered, I guess a weed, but it was, it was such an aggressive grower and it grew short that it was even easy to maintain. And it kept the rest of the weeds from out taking it. It's also a nitrogen fixer, so it pulls nitrogen out of the air and shares it with microbes in the soil. Um, right. So it doesn't need fertilizer. So clover is an excellent ground covering. I'm not against clover. I just think it has its place. And in my home lawn, I don't want clover. I'll put clover. Oh, fair enough. Up, yeah. You know, but you're, <laughs> like you're, in a farmhouse, it makes sense. Yeah, in a farmhouse, it made sense. But yeah. uh, you know, um, yeah. One man's garbage is another man's treasure, eh? So <laughs> yeah. So no mo may though. What that is, what happens is if you do that. So we have what's called the one third rule. So that you should never remove more than one third of the grass blades length in a single mowing. If you do that, okay. the grass can grow healthy. It's just like trimming your nails, right? You can trim your fingernails and you're good. But if you cut too low and you cut a finger off, you're in trouble. It's the so same. So there's a difference the between a haircut and a haircut and a scalping, really. I mean, like what we're talking about. It's exactly the same. That's exactly how you'd say it with the lawn. Oh my God. So All right. That requires frequent mowing. If you were to let your lawn go for the entire month of May and then you tried to cut it, you would do serious harm and damage to it. Um, in fact, there would probably be no green left because all of the grass would have had to, to lengthen at the base so much to hold up those yeah, stalks. It'll be yellow so, down there. Yeah, it'd be it'd be a real problem. And your HOA wouldn't like it and your neighbors wouldn't like it. So so we had a yeah. septic field and it grew so fast that if we if we missed a weekend, we would cut it and then it would be a yellow field instead of green. Because mm -hmm. we were basically decapitating the grass. That's exactly right. So no and mome is not healthy. It was not grass. healthy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. My God. All right. Well, that's interesting. I, I didn't know. Oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, next question. 1978 house in Michigan. Michael wants to know evergreen box bushes, question mark, in front of the porch are now in the shade of a tree for most or all day, slowly dying, shade friendly replacement. So, yeah, that's, I'm not quite as up with trees and shrubs and things like that but when it comes to shade i like hostas but see those are that's more of a that's not a woody ornamental which is what you want for you know, you know you're going to want something as a base uh foundation sure. around your house so 
Yeah, I don't have a great answer for you there. You know, you don't have to be a landscape artist, Alan. That's not why we're here today. (laughs) But like I said, we are scattered all over the planet doing a live show. (laughs) And that just speaks to our understanding of the question itself. All right. Um, Let's get to another question here, my man. Steve-O, son. Okay, what's the best way to remove columnar aspen suckers from the lawn? Am I even saying that right? Do I have to rip them out by hand or can I just keep on mowing them down? Or can I throw a grenade at it? Like, what do we, what do you do? Yeah, you just have to keep mowing and hope for the best. So some trees just send up suckers. It's just what they do. Uh, that's I what that is. Aspen. Okay, that's a, that's a tree growing from a root looking for a new location? Yeah, they just grow in weird ways, you know, for whatever reason. So, yeah, you just have to okay. keep mowing. All right. Well, that's easy. All right. We got five minutes left, guys. Let's go through some rapid fire stuff. If you have asked a question and we haven't gotten to it, feel free to jump in. All right. Let's, let's just try to do some rapid fire stuff. Um, if you wait till the end, you're going to get a half an answer and that's okay. We'll do the best we can. All right. Um, have you ever dealt with bamboo? (laughs) No, not personally. I mean, there's a lot of it that grows around here. Uh, I've heard the stories about it being invasive. I've heard about people buying bamboo that's not supposed to be invasive and then it it is. Um, but no, I've never actually had to deal with it, never planted it or put it anywhere. I think it's cool though. (laughs) <laughs> that's interesting i've heard people using it as like a um like a privacy fence yeah i mean it grows it's it, it grows it looks great too it grows super tall has really pretty whatever stalks yeah it's pretty nice cool. all right and I, I saw something in the comments real quick if um if you're really quiet can you hear grass grow i can i talk to <laughs> me you're the grass whisperer i can I hear mine it. right now <laughs> <laughs> And it's outside. That's awesome. All right. Should we bag the grass cutting or leave them on the lawn? Great yeah, question. That's a, that's a very good question. So I like to mulch, which is you know pushing the grass clippings back in. I like to keep my organic material that I've worked so hard to grow. I like to keep it in my lawn. And that's a, that's an eco-friendly type way to do it, recycling those clippings. Um, however, there are cases where if you have an underpowered lawnmower or the lawn gets away from you and it's going to leave clumps when you mow, that can actually yeah. kill spots of the grass. So in that case, you're going to want to go ahead and bag. And so that happens to me a couple of times a year where I do need to bag the clippings because things got away from me or maybe you have disease in the lawn. And so you want to bag the clippings. So the disease is taken away instead of redistributed through the lawn. So there are some questions. Yeah. Yeah. So it, as long as you don't get away, how often do you cut your grass in the summertime or in this, in the spring, and the fall, how often do you cut the grass? So right now, because uh, I'm in Florida, I'm cutting every third day. Okay. Um, and in the springtime for me, it's once a week. Okay. Yep. Now right. up north, so that, that changes different. based on zones. Like up north, it's a spring and fall growing season. Yep. So you'd be doing twice a week at least. If for if you're a nut like me, yeah, most people yeah. still mow every week. But when you mow, like I say the you more know, most you of mow, us do. I, I remember everybody in my neighborhood mowed once a week, and then so yeah. you'd had to bag because it was just too much. It's pretty standard. Yep. Yeah, uh, Rebecca wants to know if zoysia is good. Yeah, all I love grass zoysia. is good. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll give you some quick, I mean, zoysia grass in the South is an excellent alternative. It's the best barefoot grass, that and Bermuda grass. So St. Augustine that I have is not good barefoot grass. People no, call no, it no, no, grass. no, no, no. I, I did some work in my front yard and I got yeah. on my knees and that stuff. I'll tell you, it was like torture. Yeah. So zoysia is soft and you can mow it really low. You can mow it at one inch or lower. Uh, okay. You can let it grow a little taller. It's got rhizomes and stolons. It's very thick. It will keep weeds out. Can't say enough good things about zoysia grass. All right. What about raking your lawn to get rid of dead grass? Yeah. So cool season lawns in the spring, when you're coming out of winter, you want to do a lot of light raking to create airflow and pull the dead grass out. You may need to dethatch, but that's a whole nother discussion there. Sure. Um, in the South, I don't necessarily recommend raking lawns because our grass is so aggressive. It grows through anything that's dead and the sun breaks it down. And so right. not a lot of need to rake in the South. Oh, wow. Okay. Awesome. That's amazing how the different climates and different grassy, you know, in- yeah. Create such a habits. different maintenance environment. Yep. All right. Uh, Jose wants to know how to get rid of goat heads. What's a goat head? Must be some kind of weed. So. Sounds like it. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't uh, had to deal with that one. Sorry, Jose. <laughs> Sorry, my friend. All right, that's all right. Hey, wait, wait. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. We stumped the lawn care nut. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get on to the next question here. Uh, Steve-O, is there a downside to using a single type of grass? Is there a good, cool grass that you can mow low? Great question. So when you Mm. do one type of grass, what you get is what's called a mono stand. And when I say that's one cultivar, one variety. So, you know, um, which is what we mostly have in the South. Like I have Palmetto St. Augustine. It's all one 
cultivar of St. Augustine grass. But up north, you can have mixes of Kentucky bluegrass, different varieties or different cultivars. And mm. the, the reason you'd want to have one single cultivar is because the lawn looks completely beautifully uniform. And there's something about that. Like if you have all midnight Kentucky bluegrass and that's all yep. you have, they're gorgeous. However, what can happen though is if mid, and I don't know if this is true, but if midnight Kentucky bluegrass is susceptible to say brown patch disease and you get brown patch, your whole lawn can get wiped out. Whereas if you plant three or four varieties of Kentucky bluegrass or even Kentucky bluegrass with tall fescue or Kentucky bluegrass with ryegrass, now one will pick up where the other may be weak. However, they, and they blend just fine. They blend beautifully, but they don't look as good as that 100% perfect mono stamp. Got so, it. yeah, so that, and that, that's why you want to be careful with that type of situation. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it comes down to how flexible do you, need, do you need the yard to be over the course of a four season climate? Yep. It's like a mono, it's called a monoculture. Um, nice. Yeah. You don't want to plant a monoculture if you can help it. All right. Well, guys, I think we're going to be, uh, we're going to call it, we're, we're in for an hour Q and a with Fun the stuff. lawn care, not Alan dude. Um, let's just make sure that we put up information to how you can reach Alan. Okay. If you're not familiar, the lawn care, not go check him out on YouTube, subscribe to his channel and go check out his videos because here's what I've learned from him. It's like taking care of your, your yard, your lawn. It is a relationship. This is not a quick fix program. Okay. The quick fix is a lot of time and a lot of money. You got to rip out the old yard and put in a brand new one. But if you want to just restore it, you want to maintain it, you got to get to know it. All right. And he's got a program for that. He's got a, he's got uh, yardmastery.com. You can go to, you can download his app at the play store. All right. Lots of information, lots of tools, buy his products, support a guy who's bringing all that years of experience and is going to bring it to you and give you good quality and good value for your dollar. All right. Don't, don't buy stuff that's going to throw in your yard that claims to be X, Y, and Z. And it's all just dead and not doing anything for you. Alan, thanks for joining us today. Really do appreciate it. Make sure we're going to put all this information in the video description. So if you miss something, that information will be there. You can check out the links later. And if you have any more questions, feel free to hit up the comment section in the video after the fact. I'll do my best to see if we can get some information for you. But at the end of the day, I don't know nothing about grass. All right the kind that grows in your lawn or otherwise. Uh, so hit him up and be his new best friend. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Alan, cheers, buddy. We're going to have to do this again because I got a feeling that the community is going to demand another hour of your time. Well, I think I need to come over to Leesburg and help you with your lawn when you're ready. When that oh. project is at a point where you need a lawn, when you're not stomping on it anymore. I, you let I, me know. I, I just don't stay in one place long enough to have a relationship. <laughs> well, we'll just, we'll love her and leave her. We'll love her and leave her. <laughs> All right. I appreciate it, buddy. Listen, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, guys, for everybody in the community, cheers. Um, this has been awesome fun. I learned a lot. I hope you did too. All right. We'll see you again in the next live show next Tuesday night at five o'clock. Cheers to next time. Remember, you're your best contractor out there. Why hire when you can do it yourself? Cheers. <laughs>